The Death of the Hired Man by Robert Frost Mary sat musing on the lamp flame at the table, waiting for Warren. When she heard his step, she ran on tiptoe down the darkened passage to meet him in the doorway with the news and put him on his guard. Silas is back! She pushed him outward with her through the door and shut it after her. Be kind, she said. She took the market things from Warren's arms and set them on the porch, then drew him down to sit beside her on the wooden steps. When was I anything but kind to him? But I'll not have the fellow back, he said. I told him so last hang, didn't I? If he left then, I said, that ended it. What good is he? Who else will harbor him? At his age, for little he can do. What help is he there's no depending on? Off he goes always when I need him most. He thinks he ought to earn a little pay. Yet enough at least to buy tobacco with, so he won't have to beg and be beholden. All right, I say. I can't afford to pay. Any fixed wages, though I wish I could. Someone else can. Then the someone else will have to do. I shouldn't mind his battering himself. If that was what it was, you can be certain. When he begins like that, there's someone at him, trying to coax him off with pocket money in haying time when any help is scarce. In winter he comes back to us, I'm done. Shh, not so loud, he'll hear you, Mary said. I want him to. He'll have to soon or late. He's worn out, he's asleep beside the stove. When I came up from Rose I found him here, huddled against the barn door, fast asleep. A miserable sight, and frightening too. You needn't smile. I didn't recognize him. It wasn't for looking for him, and he's changed. Wait till you see. Where did you say he'd been? He didn't say I dragged him to the house, and gave him tea and tried to make him smoke. I tried to make him talk about his travels. Nothing would do. He just kept nodding off. What did he say? Did he say anything? But little. Anything? Mary, confess. He said he'd come to ditch the meadow for me. Warn! But did he? I just want to know. Of course he did. What would you have him say? Surely you wouldn't grudge the poor old man some humble way to save his self-respect. He added, if you really care to know. He meant to clear the upper pasture, too. That sounds like something you have heard before. Warren, I wish you could have heard the way he jumbled everything. I stopped to look. Two or three times. He'd maybe feel so queer to see that he was talking in his sleep. He ran on Harold Wilson. You remember, the boy you had hang four years since? He's finished school and teaching at his college. Silas declares you'll have to get him back. He says they too will make a team for work. Between them they will lay this farm as smooth. The way he mixed that with other things. He thinks young Wilson a likely lad, though daft, on education. You know how they fought. All through July, under the blazing sun, Silas up on the cart to build the load, Harold along beside to pitch it on. Yes, I took care to keep well out of earshot. Well, those days trouble Silas like a dream. You wouldn't think they would. How some things linger. Harold's young college boy's assurance piqued him. After so many years, he still keeps finding good arguments he sees might have used. I sympathize. I know just how it feels. To think of the right thing to say too late. Harold's associated in his mind with Latin. He asked me what I thought of Harold, saying he studied Latin like the violin, because he liked it. That, an argument. He said he couldn't make the boy believe. He could find water with a hazel prong, which showed how much good school had ever done him. He wanted to go over that, but most of all, he thinks if he could have another chance to teach him how to build a load of hay. I know that Slyless is one accomplishment. He bundles every forkful in its place and tags and numbers it for future reference so that he can find it easily and dislodge it. In the unloading, Silas does that well. He takes it out in bunches like big bird's nests. You never see him standing on the hay. He's trying to lift, straining to lift himself. He thinks if he could teach him that, he'd be some good, perhaps, to someone in the world. He hates to see a boy the fool of books. Poor Silas, so concerned for other folk. And nothing to look backward to with pride, and nothing to look forward to with hope. So now, and never any different, part of a moon was falling down the west, dragging the whole sky with it to the hills. Its light poured softly in her lap. She saw it and spread her apron to it. 
she put out her hand among the harp-like morning glory strings, talked with the dew from garden bed to eaves, as if she played unheard some tenderness that wrought on him beside her in the night. Warn, she said, he has come home to die. You needn't be afraid he'll leave you all this time. Home, he mocked gently. Yes, what else but home? It all depends on what you mean by home. Of course he's nothing to us any more than was the hound that came a stranger to us out of the woods worn out upon the trail. Home is a place where, when you have to go there, they'll have to take you in. I should have called it something you somehow haven't to deserve. Warren leaned out and took a step or two, picked up a little stick and brought it back, and broke it in his hand and tossed it by. Silas has better claim on us, you think, than on his brother. Thirteen little miles as the road winds would bring him to his door. Silas has walked that far, no doubt, today. Why didn't he go there? His brother's rich. A somebody, director in the bank. He never told us that. I think his brother ought to help, of course. I'll see to it if there is need. He ought of right take him in, and might be willing to. He may be better than appearances, but have some pity on Silas. Do you think if he had any pride in claiming kin, or anything he looked for from his brother, he'd keep so still about him all this time? I wonder what's between them. I can tell you. Silas is what he is. We wouldn't mind him, but just the kind that kinsfolk can't abide. He never did a thing so very bad. He don't know why he isn't quite as good as anyone. Worthless though he is, he won't be made ashamed to please his brother. I can't think Si ever hurt anyone. No, but he hurt my heart the way he lay and rolled his old head in that sharp-edged chair back. He wouldn't let me put him on the lounge. You must go and see what you can do. I made the bed up for him there tonight. You'd be surprised at him how much he is broken. His working days are done, I'm sure of it. I'd be not in a hurry to say that. I haven't been. Go, look, see for yourself. But Warren, please remember how it is. He's come to help you ditch the meadow. He has a plan. You mustn't laugh at him. He may not speak of it, and then he may. I'll sit and see that small sailing cloud will hit or miss the moon. It hit the moon. Then there were three there making a dim row, the moon, the little silver cloud, and she. Warren returned, too soon it seemed to her, sipped to her side, cut up her hand and waited. Warren, she questioned. Dead was all he answered. The Death of the Hired Man, a narrative poem by Robert Frost, revolves around the old farmhand named Silas who returns to the farm of Warren and Mary after many years of wandering an unreliable service. Silas comes back seeking a place to die. Warren, the practical farmer, feels that Silas cannot expect to be taken in after failing to fulfill his duties when he was needed the most. Mary, on the other hand, views Silas with compassion, emphasizing that he has nowhere else to go. The poem ends with the revelation that Silas has died in his sleep, symbolizing the loneliness and dignity of human life and death.